Thanks for watching this Magellan update. As many of you may be aware, we've recently completed a series of investor briefings around Australia and New Zealand. We invited questions to be submitted via an app and we've consolidated those questions uh, to the most relevant and often asked questions. So Hamish, maybe to you first, there were lots of questions around climate change. Can you talk us through how it figures in your investment thinking and strategy? Well, let me start at a high level. If, if we're looking at the longer term, we have the view that it's likely the world is going to have to decarbonise. And as you decarbonise an economy, that's going to come at a cost to many businesses in the world. So you have to think it as an economic cost of decarbonisation of the uh, uh, economy uh, over time. When we look at our portfolio, we, we, we don't do any oil and gas. Uh, we don't do any mining company, no coal mining. So, and we look at the carbon footprint of our portfolio and we measure the carbon footprint. And our portfolio is very, very low carbon. So when we think about the cost of carbon and our carbon footprint, it's very, very low in the portfolio. So whilst this is a large issue for business around the world taking a long enough viewpoint, um, within our portfolio, it's probably not the highest issue just because our portfolio is pretty unique in terms of its carbon footprint. And many of the companies we invest in are taking very substantial actions in their own right. Microsoft, for instance, the other uh, day announced that they're going to zero carbon, but not only zero carbon, they're planning to effectively offset all carbon emissions that Microsoft has ever contributed uh, uh, towards alphabets going zero carbon, Facebook zero carbon, Apple zero carbon, Nestle's on a huge uh, pathway of reducing their carbon footprint, plus many other environmental issues. So we're, we're very lucky that we, we, we invest in some of the best companies and, and forward thinking companies in the world who are really mitigating this, this risk on behalf of our investors. Uh, they're taking the, the, this action. So it's a material issue for many companies in the world, but it's not the biggest issue in terms of the risk inside uh, Magellan's portfolios. So question to you, Michael, uh, if the US-China trade war escalates, could the Chinese government retaliate in a way that impacts US economic interests in China? Sure, absolutely. Um, I could see the Chinese um, going after specific US industries. Um, that are important to the US government, um, less so important to US consumers or important to um, those companies that might be doing business in China, for example, um, because Chinese consumers want those products. So I would see them going after um, industries um, and products that get consumed by defense contractors in the United States, um, some critical components for weapon systems, for example, some critical minerals that go into very sophisticated weaponry, so I think that's the kind of thing that they would focus on if this gets ramped up. So Hamish, how big is too big? Can you see a time when governments will seek to split the major technology companies of the world like Standard Oil happened in the last century? Well, that's certainly a possibility. It's been a big part of the democratic side of the debate here in the United States. So the, Elizabeth Warren was very much about breaking up big, big tech. Should you dismember Alphabet, separate the ad business from the search business, from the YouTube business? Should you undo some of the acquisitions of Facebook uh, in, uh, uh, that, that, that's happened there? At the moment, they're going to have to do it under current antitrust uh, laws, and it's been looked at by the Federal Trade uh, uh, commission uh, at the moment and the Department of Justice. They kind of split the tech companies into, into two buckets here. It's been, it's been looked at. Um, I think it's going to be a hard ask to do it under current legislation, which means you need new legislation. And without a fundamental change in the makeup of, of Congress and the Senate, it's probably not the thing that you think is going to be passed new antitrust legislations, because these are, don't forget, the market leading firms in America. And to dismember their tech companies that are leading the world, there's certainly people, whilst it's a big debate, are they actually going to enact that? But if it was to happen, I would argue to the sum of the parts of Facebook between WhatsApp, Instagram and Facebook may well be more than the trading value of Facebook today. So are we that worried about this, um, uh, uh, this risk? 
no, no, we're not that worried. I, is it a risk? Yes, it is a risk. Um, do I think it's an immediate term risk? I think there's a lot of water to flow under that, that bridge politically in the, in the United States. So Michael, if Biden wins, how do you see US foreign policy and the approach to China changing? So the first thing I'd say is that the, the tone out of Washington will change. Um, it won't be, um, I love Xi Jinping one minute and the Chinese are destroying our economy the next minute. It'll be much more balanced. It'll be much more sophisticated, the rhetoric coming out of Washington. Having said that, I do think we won't see a return to the Obama administration where Washington wasn't putting a lot of pressure on China with regard to the systemic issues that we care about. Um, I think a Biden administration, I quite, quite frankly think any Democratic administration, um, is going to be a little bit more hard-edged than the Obama administration was. But they won't focus on issues like the trade deficit. They'll focus on um, the anti-competitive practices that the Chinese um, routinely conduct, the theft of intellectual property, the subsidies to their corporations, um, the, the pressuring of, technology, of, of firms to hand over technology. Those are the kind of issues that I think they'll focus on. Hamish, a question that came through, can you give a reason why you're not an investor in Amazon, despite you suggesting it's a great business? Well, first of all, it is a great business. Uh, the Amazon Web Services businesses, that is a space we understand very well. We own three of the four hyperscale players in the world, so it'd be logic for us to own the fourth one. Cloud computing and that whole industry is a strategic thematic for us at, at Magellan, enormous opportunity. And Amazon's in a box seat there, there for the development of that industry. And their e-commerce business is a very, very powerful business. The fundamental reason for us is we're here to make valuation calls. Uh, Amazon trades at very high multiples, probably justifiably high multiples, but it's not something that we can easily feel the value on. And we think there's a very wide range of outcomes. And if we don't have a very high degree of conviction around the valuation of something, no matter how good the business is, we won't buy, we, we, we won't buy it. And so far, I may well have been wrong in, in, in that decision. But it's nothing about the business. It's nothing about Jeff, Jeff Bezos, who's one of the most remarkable visionaries of a founder of business I've, I've, I've ever uh, seen. And I actually wouldn't bet, bet against Amazon uh, ever. Uh, but if it got to a price where I felt that the, the valuation case was easy, uh, I would buy it in a, in a heartbeat. Michael, do you have concerns about Russia's influence on the world? Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting to compare kind of China's approach to the world and Russia's approach to the world. Um, China's approach is to build influence by making themselves stronger. Um, Russia's approach to the world is they know they can't make themselves stronger, right? Their, their economy is heading in the wrong direction. Um, and so their approach is to undermine the United States and U.S. allies wherever they can. So to weaken us relative to them. That's how they play the game. And they do that, they do that in many, many areas around the world. Um, they do it directly um, in terms of attacking the United States with, uh, with um, propaganda, um, 2016. And it's, it's happened um, consistently since then. It's gonna happen again here in the 2020 election. Um, but even going as far as providing support to the Taliban in Afghanistan, you would say to yourself, why would the Russians ever support an Islamic extremist organization? And the answer is just to make the life of the United States difficult. And they do that in a number of places. So that's their approach, is, uh, is do whatever they can to weaken us to make themselves relatively stronger. Another interesting way to think about Russia is that Vladimir Putin has actually done a disservice to his country, um, strategically and over the long term. Because if you think about um, what the Russian economy needs in the long term, it's integration with the West. That's its only hope. And because he invaded Georgia, because he invaded Ukraine, he ended any opportunity of that happening. So he has actually done his country a disservice. Hamish, 
Is India the next big opportunity after China? Well, people simplify the India equation. Of course, India has got a very large population, similar in size to, to, to China. Its economy is growing, but it's a far smaller economy. And there are people say, well, it's an English-speaking economy. It's a well-educated uh, society. Therefore, the opportunity must be of similar scale to China. And what we would say is you have to look at the speed of development, you have to look at the infrastructure in the economy, you have to look at the ease of doing business and the openness of the economy to doing business in India. And then the picture looks very, very different between India and, and China. They haven't invested in their infrastructure. No large scale manufacturing businesses can be set up uh, based out of India other than solely for the Indian economy, but it's not gonna be the manufacturing hub of the world despite the labor that they have uh, in, the, in the market. And when we look at the market opportunities in, in, in India today, and we do look at the market opportunities in India, very few of them make the top, top quality tier of companies in, in the world, just because they're not global, they're not multinational, they've got very, very few multinational businesses there. And the, and the better businesses tend to either be subsidiaries of multinationals, typically trading at high prices, fairly illiquid, uh, listed in India, uh, or, they're, or they're the sort of conglomerates controlled by some of the very large Indian uh, uh, families there. So we're not saying we're not going to invest in India, but we don't find the scale of opportunities, the scale for business uh, and the consumption story that we're seeing in China. Uh, and therefore, it's just a much more limited investment universe from our perspective. But it may change over time, but it, their economy is not evolving anywhere near the pace uh, that the Chinese economy has ha has evolved. So I put them in very, very different investment buckets, notwithstanding at a very high level, they may seem similar. They're not from a business perspective similar. I've had a lot of experience dealing with Indians um, over the years, and I couldn't agree more with um, the point about the difficulty of getting things done there. Um, it's just really hard. Um, and, and I've never been 100% sure why, but if they can make something difficult, they make it difficult. So Michael, what is your opinion about cyber security as a major threat in the coming years, both from a military perspective, as well as a commercial perspective, with particular reference maybe to the dark web? So I don't think cyber is a major threat in terms of a catastrophic attack. Um, the countries with the capability to take down um, an electric grid or a telecommunication system or a financial system are really only two, Russia and China. Um, and both of them certainly have the capability to do that and both of them are prepared to do that, but only if we ever enter a hot war with them. You know, then they would attack our critical infrastructure with cyber, but quite frankly, we would attack theirs. And in a non-war situation, um, the use of cyber to attack infrastructure becomes a mutually assured destruction issue. Right? If they did it to us, we know that they know that, that we turn around and do it to them. So I don't worry about that. Um, so it's not a catastrophic issue. It is a significant issue, though, from, from two perspectives. One is the, the theft of intellectual property um, is just massive. And the Chinese lead the way, but the Chinese are not the only ones that do this. Um, countries in the West do not do this, um, don't steal intellectual property and give it to their companies, but the Chinese and others do. Um, and then I'd also say that cybercrime is a major issue. There is now more money made through cybercrime than through the illicit drug trade. Uh, it's just amazing. Um, and so you have, you have all these organized crime groups around the world who are using ransomware to simply make money. Um, and actually, one country, North Korea, is in that business too. It's one of the ways that North Koreans use to get around sanctions. Um, and so that is a major issue that firms and individuals need to pay attention to and why cybersecurity um, is so important. Okay, can I ask a question? How come America hasn't shut Korea's access off to, to the web or is it China who gives them access to enable them to access the global internet? So the North Koreans don't do it out of North Korea because there essentially is no internet there. So the North Koreans go other places in the world 
and conduct these operations. China's one, but not the only one. So it's not easy to find out where they're operating from. And, and if you think about how, how the business model kind of works, um, if you shut down a server that somebody is attacking you from, it is very easy to take maybe an hour or two hours and move from that server to another server and start all over again. So um, using cyber offense... In the benefit defense, of the web. Yes, it's the benefit of the web, right? Distributed everywhere. Yes. Um, to use cyber offense as defense doesn't work very well at the end of the day. Michael, we've covered a lot of territory, a lot of topics. Is there an area that we should be focusing on or asking more about? I think there's, there's one in the short term and one in the medium term that we haven't talked about. The, the, short, term, the short term issue is that the Iranians, again, um, are spinning their centrifuges and enriching uranium, and they just announced that they now have enough enriched uranium for one nuclear weapon. Um, they, are, they are trying to make a point here that because we pulled out, the United States pulled out of the nuclear agreement, they don't have to be in it either. And so they're trying to put some pressure on us and the Europeans by showing that there's a consequence, right, to, to our actions. Um, but the reason this is important and the reason this bec could become an important issue is that nobody watches how much enriched uranium they have more closely than the Israelis. And if the Iranians get to a point where the Israelis are concerned about how much they have, concerned that they may in the middle of the night spirit that enriched uranium away to a covert facility where nobody knows where it is, the Israelis will again, as they did in 2011 and 2012, think about a military strike against Iran. So that is a, that's an issue we all have to focus on that we haven't talked about. I think the medium term issue um, is where, where we are as a world in terms of um, the treaties governing nuclear weapons. They have eroded and they've eroded significantly. Um, the, the INF treaty, the, the, the treaty that governs um, um, intermediate range nuclear missiles, um, the United States pulled out of in the last year. And the United States pulled out of it because the Russians were essentially ignoring it and violating um, um, the, the rules that governed it. And so we pulled out. So there's, there's one treaty that has just fallen apart. There's another treaty called the START Treaty, which comes up for renegotiation here um, in just a few months. And we'll see how both Russia and the United States handle that. Um, but I think we're going to have to not only figure out a way to rework these treaties with the Russians, but also start bringing in the Chinese, because the Chinese also have nuclear weapons, and they've never been part of any nuclear weapons agreement. And um, we kind of have to have a three-way agreement going forward rather than a two. But, but these, 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 these agreements have really weakened, and that should be a concerning thing to a lot of people. Hamish, we've spoken quite at length around the coronavirus. Do you have an overarching observation as we sit here today? Well, an observation which people probably aren't thinking about. Well, they're thinking about the economic damage that can be done in the short term, and that could be quite severe in the next three to six months, and we'll see a lot of panic and a lot of volatility. But 12 months from now, I think that volatility will pass. But during this period of economic disruption, which is occurring, we're going to have further interest rate cuts all around the world. So we are lowering interest rates around the world. And that's gonna have a very interesting impact on markets 12 months from now, because it's gonna be very hard for the central banks post this to reverse the interest rate cuts they're putting in. So rates will be even lower and lower rates support higher valuation. So while everybody's panicking today about coronavirus, because we don't know the extent of the economic damage that is gonna be done in the short term, in the medium term, it's likely to cause a world of even lower interest rates than we would have had before coronavirus. So I would say that if, if, if anybody's thinking on buy the dips, buy the dips here, because we're gonna come out of this. This will, we will recover from coronavirus, but we'll recover from a world with even lower interest rates. And I don't think people are focused on that 
uh, at the moment. They're focused on the lower interest rates, trying to solve the short term issue. But it's lowering the bar again, which is creating a very, very interesting dynamic if you, if you can look more than sort of three months into the, into the future here. Thanks, Hamish. A pleasure, Frank. Thanks, Michael. You're welcome. And thanks for watching this update. As a general reminder, we will be uh, hosting a recording of the full uh, investor briefing on our website. Thanks.